Joel Osteen. Some have called him the most popular preacher in America. Some of you here at Unity listen or watch Joel because he is so positive. Well, there's a good reason for that. Because long before there was a Joel Osteen, there was Howard Caesar. Howard Caesar was the minister, senior minister at Unity of Houston for 34 years. And when Howard first arrived in Texas, John Osteen and his nearby Lakewood Church had already been established, but it became clear that both John and his son Joel would be highly inspired by Howard's positive and progressive New Thought messages. So much so that years later, Joel Osteen said on the Oprah Winfrey show that Howard Caesar was one of his greatest influences. Howard has spoken all over the world. He's conducted panels and he's been on national television programs with the likes of Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, Michael Beckwith, the Dalai Lama, Ian Van Zant, Norman Vincent Peale, and of late, Marianne Williamson. He is an author, speaker, inspirational leader, new thought giant, and just an all around nice guy. Joining us from Sugar Land, Texas, please give a very warm Unity Renaissance welcome to Mr. Howard Caesar. <laughs> Howard, good morning. So good to have you here today. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, just recently I was speaking with Reverend Richard Bunch, who was our transitional minister up until about a week ago. And uh, he's told me some stories that I had heard before. And one of them was that when people would listen sometimes to Joel Osteen on television there in Houston, they would say that they'd heard that sermon before, that message before. Tell us just a quick story of a Sunday message that you once gave called Fully Equipped. I had known John. Uh, we were great friends. I was Joel's father, and uh, he took, uh, Joel took over not having been to seminary. And so uh, he was kind of searching and seeking for material for his Sunday lessons, of course. And people started telling me, I was on TV, he was on TV, <clears throat> and they would watch him uh, at an earlier time and then come to our service. And so when they'd come through, they'd say, you know, I just, I just listened to Joel uh, and his lesson on TV. And I swear it was, ex it was just what you were talking about, almost, you know, the same uh, two weeks ago. And so I had a lot of people telling me that who were following him. And so I didn't think too much of it. But then one, one day, you know, he was on TV many times during the week. And so uh, one time when I was home, I came across him on a weeknight or something. And I last, listened a while and I heard him give a, a talk on fully equipped, uh, which I had just given like three weeks earlier. And so I thought, well, gosh, I guess it's true. He, he is actually seeking out somehow or another getting tapes. Back then it was tapes um, or CDs of my talks and would listen to them and take material. But he was, um, he was a bit of new thought, not all the way, but he definitely was about bringing a more positive, inspiring message that was not diminishing people or beating them down. Um, so I give him a lot of credit. He's, uh, he's really impacted a lot of lives and brought uh, quite a bit of positivity. I wouldn't necessarily believe, or not, not believe, but uh, agree with everything that they teach. But um, again, we honor all paths. He wasn't the first one to do this. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, many years earlier, who wrote The uh, Power of Positive Thinking, he also was influenced. Now, the way Joel and John were influenced by by uh, the Fillmores, who founded Unity. Norman Vincent Peale was influenced by a man by the name of Ernest Holmes, who was also a great new thought leader. And you'll see how this ties into Reverend Claudia Renee here in just a second. But here are some great Christian preachers who are influenced by new thought messengers like the Fillmores, like Ernest Holmes. I know that uh, Ernest Holmes was a, became a, actually a friend of Norman Vincent Peale, and Norman Vincent Peale, when he wrote his book, The Power of Positive Thinking, later was uh, and spoke to different audiences in New Thought. I had him come actually in my first ministry in Olympia, Washington. I rented a, a big facility at the college there, and I had him come twice in Houston, but um, his he was able to say and honor the fact that he had been reading the writings of Charles Fillmore and that... Um, he had actually been inspired to write the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, uh, as a result of doing or reading some of Charles' writings. Um, so he, he was a great soul. Um, when uh, I had him come speak at my ministries, he was in his 80s. 
um, and just uh, such a warm, beautiful uh, soul and gentleman. Uh, and his wife, Ruth, was wonderful, too. She always accompanied him, of course. She kind of looked after him quite um, like like a mother, actually, making sure that he was taken care of. Ernest Holmes Ernest started uh, the, uh, the church, Religious Science, which today is Centers for Spiritual Living. And I think it's interesting because our minister, who's going to be here in, in about a month, uh, Claudia Rene, is both a Centers for Spiritual Living minister and a unity minister. Sounds like that's the best of, of both worlds when it comes to new thought. What do you think, Howard? Well, I think that's great. Um, really, new thought is an umbrella, and we all share in those teachings, and we are all positive, practical, and progressive, I like to say. And <clears throat> the minister that took over for me, Michael Gott, uh, he also had come up first in the Centers for Spiritual Living and then became ordained in unity. So he has uh, the wonderful mix of both, uh, which obviously have many, many similarities. Our mission is all important, especially right now. So let me hand the football off to you once again, Howard Caesar. All right, uh, I think that means I'm to share my message today, which is clarity of mission. And, uh, you know, that is so important and so vital. I know that, um, you know, there isn't anything new under the sun. And I know that unity and the, uh, the church that you're attending uh, really emphasize these things, but we can't have it uh, really built into our consciousness enough on a regular basis. And uh, so I think that, you know, our mission can be feeling kind of broad, but also we can kind of narrow it down. Uh, so there are some unique or, or aspects of it that we always keep in front of us. Um, I think of our purpose as being almost synonymous with our mission. Our mission and our purpose are very much the same. And um, I did some studying in India, actually, and took some courses there uh, in oneness. And, and it was there that they, too, emphasized the idea of our mission and our purpose. And they said it was basically three things that were really important. And essentially, one, number one was to, to learn, to grow, and to evolve um, spiritually and deepen. And number two was uh, to be of service, to allow God to use us, to be helpful, to be making a difference. And third, they say, was the ultimate, which was oneness, that we are really to uh, come into the consciousness of our oneness with God, our oneness with all that is, everyone, everything, um, to take on the character and the likeness of God. Uh, very, very powerful. So in one sentence, we could say that basically our mission is a transformation of consciousness. You know, individually, it's important for us uh, to be blossoming and taking on that consciousness of oneness with God, but also our place in the world. Uh, it helps to not only transform us, but transform the world. We become a light in the world, and it's important to look at it because we're all interconnected. You know, there was a, a answering machine I came across uh, of a guy, very unique, and um, so when you called him and he wasn't there, the recording uh, went like this. Hello, this is not an answering machine. This is a questioning machine. The questions are, who are you? What do you want? And if you think those are trivial questions, understand that many people go through their entire lives not finding the answer to either one. Beep. <laughs> I thought that was so clever and so wonderful, but it was so true because people don't know who they are. Many people are trying to find in the physical world who they are, that they are their bank account, their car, their house, um, their uh, social status, their job, all of these things. They're important and they're part of life and they're wonderful. But the most important thing is to come around to knowing what we are, what we are, our true identity. And at our core, we are a spiritual being. At our core, we are divine. We are divine beings. You know, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. The light is what God is. Therefore, we carry the light of God within us. Uh, it was the Apostle Paul that said uh, the, the, the mystery which has been hidden for ages and generations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, again, Christ being our divine self. And even dating back to the most ancient of 
writings and teachings as far back as you can go to the Vedanta and the Upanishads, they use the word self with a capital S. There is the self. And they were very clear about it being really uh, the divine, the God self that is within us. So there is a magnificence that is in you that is in probably contrast to what we basically are able to perceive ourselves to be. It can be a big leap for a lot of people uh, to realize that they are divine as children of God. But you know, when, when a seed is planted in the earth, the obligation of the seed is to realize itself and to be that which it has been intended to be. Well, we have the seed of God in us. So our somewhat obligation is in this path on earth, it is to be the self that God holds us to be, created us to be, and planted us in this world to let our light shine and be. You know, many a psychologists talk about us having many selves. There's a happy self, a sad self, a guilty self, a angry self, all of these. Um, and, and granted, that's true. But I like to narrow it down simply to there are two main selves that we need to remember. And one self is really the divine self. It is the, the true self, the God self, the made in the image and after the likeness self. It is perfect. It is whole. It is already complete. I remember reading in some of my studies of people who had near-death experiences, one had this incredible realization after he came back from this near-death experience, and his statement was, we are already what we are trying to attain. We're already created that. So that's one self. And then the other self is our separate self. Um, it's basically the ego self. It's the part that man has created by virtue of the conditioning of the world that they've been in. And that, that true self gets hidden, it gets covered over, it gets submerged. I like to give the example of, um, you know, we all have a hand, and this is the hand of God. God gave us this hand, and we can do so many things with it. We can grasp onto it, we can pick up a dime, we can shake a hand, we can uh, touch a person, <clears throat> all this. But what we've done to some extent is really put on this other separate self. And that's like putting a glove over the hand of God. And it's stiff, it's metallic, it's not pliable, it can't function the way it was intended to function. And so a big part of our life is actually removing that. You know, Carl Jung, the great psychologist, um, he said that basically there's two main segments to a person's life. That one, uh, your first, you know, half of your life or approximation is really um, developing tools to cope uh, socially and in a physical world and, <clears throat> excuse me, and basically, therefore, it's an identity, it's your personality, it's your ego that is being created. And he said then, the second half of your life or the second phase is actually uh, unlearning all that and undoing the ego. And that is the big part of uh, transformation, really, and spiritual growth is really to unlearn some of this and to release a great deal and to let go of many of the thoughts and ideas and beliefs that we have that have limited us along the way and get back to aligning with and living from uh, our true identity um, as being divine. You know, uh, the mission that we're all on really then is um, transformation of consciousness. And so it's moving from lower states to higher states, from darkness to light, from ignorance to understanding, from a sense of one's uh, humanity only to one's divinity. And Jesus even talked about there being levels of consciousness. Uh, he's quoted to say, you are from beneath and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And so we all have some work to do. And so we are blessed to be in this world and have this life, it is precious, it's a gift. We signed the ticket to get here, and we signed up for some things that we were going to go through to learn and grow as well. Uh, I know some of you are familiar with what um, Richard Bach said in, in his book Illusions about this. He said, here is a test to find out whether your mission on earth is finished. If you're alive, it isn't. So if you're alive and breathing, you're still working on your mission and being part of uh, the purpose of this life, which is 
of transformation of consciousness. And so it can be helpful really to look at, you know, when was it in our life that we all of a sudden just began to understand that we were a spiritual being and wanted to really go into the depth of that, you know, uh, to call ourselves, uh, to ourselves really, um, circumstances, good and bad, that would help us learn and grow. You know, um, there are some things that are that we know uh, in truth, and then there are some things that are mysteries that we're, we're still, you know, as we evolve, are coming to understand. We don't understand at all. I remember when I was in ministerial school back in 1975 um, at Unity World Headquarters. Back then, it was two full years uh, in a program there and with faculty. And anyway, there's a fellow named Bob Sicking there, and he was the head of uh, the uh, Association of Unity Churches and over all the ministers and ministers, a big job. He had been a minister in the field and had been brought up to that position. He, anyway, he came one day to talk to um, the student body and he talked about his experiences in World War II. And um, he talked about a time where he was walking in line with the infantry that he was a part of and all of a sudden mortar shells started flying in and so they all hit the dirt. And he said, um, the man in front of him had a mortar shell hit him in the back and he was killed. And the mortar shell and the force of it killed the man in front of that man. And he said, there was a six inch tree that was right alongside of him, Bob, when he hit the dirt. And he said the force of it sheared the tree totally in half. And he said it also sheared off his helmet, his backpack, his shirt, his pants, uh, the backs of his boots, even he said the elastic on his underwear. But he said he didn't have a mark on him. He wasn't injured, not even a cut. He told of another time where he was sitting in a foxhole for days, just sitting there, and there was no action in particular, and a mortar shell came and landed right between his legs in the sand, jumped out of the foxhole quickly, but fact of the matter is, if it hadn't been a dud, he would have been a dead man. And he looked at us and he, and he said in, with great reflection, you know, did that have to do with my consciousness? He didn't have an answer. He said, I, I was a regular guy at that young, I, at that age, I was not an angel. I'd get drunk with the guys and, you know, I was doing stuff. And he said, I don't have an answer. Some things we don't understand why some men didn't make it and why I did. And you know, we can't always answer that question, but maybe if somehow his mi mission was to remain intact, to go on and still do what uh, he was called to do. Because life tends not to be, and is not meant to be a time frame of years. It's not to be you know, a life and death. It's really a set of circumstances and experiences that we go through that give us an opportunity to learn and grow and really connect and deepen uh, with the divine. You know, uh, when you step onto the path of spiritual growth, you have to be willing to say to yourself, you know, what is it that stands in the way of my divine appointment to be that which God has seeded in me? And to be willing to become aware of that uh, and genuinely re release it and, and let it go. We are here to realize our oneness with God, and our oneness with God means our true identity is love. God is love, God is light. Inside the light is enormous, incredible love, and love is really in our heart. heart is The heart is where God does the speaking, and uh, you have to be able to be aligned with a love that is unconditional and embraces anyone and everyone. Uh, and however they show up, it's to see that they're learning and growing. I close with kind of one other story that um, I, I love to tell. And it's a true story. Again, it happens in um, 1998. And actually it was recorded by a man or he observed it. It was a man in traffic and a couple cars ahead, he watched something take place. And basically what happened was uh, it was, you know, bad traffic. It was in the morning. Um, people were coming from the suburb, heading to Washington, D.C. 
uh, in the area that he was living in. Anyway, he noticed that there was a small compact car with a lady in it that darted out into traffic and just missed uh, another driver. And um, the driver, you know, having, there is road rage going on, at least we have it in Texas, I don't know if you do in Virginia, but in any event, um, this man was furious. And so when uh, he was in the car right behind her, so uh, they came up and uh, uh, the light turned green. I mean, red, I'm sorry, red. And so the man that was furious and angry got out of the car and began to walk with his fury toward this lady in the car ahead of him. Well, she in the, in the, the rear view mirror noticed that he was coming um, and had gotten out of the car. So she jumped out of the car and she was a very attractive lady. And she began with a smile on her face, ran toward this man, wrapped her arms around him and laid a very passionate kiss on the lips before this guy knew what was happening or could say a word he had this lady do this to him she then immediately or abruptly turned went back to her car got in and drove off and left this man standing there bewildered wondering well embarrassed there were cars around that saw it and just puzzled but at the same time he was no longer angry and uh, I love that story because what he did was what she did was you know a form of enlightenment um, she knew what she was and what she was was love and love will diffuse it all love will correct it all love will make it all well again love is the most powerful thing in the universe she got out and she chose to be it in that moment and that's what we're all being asked to do is to share the light of God in us which is love which is about oneness oneness with all that is uh, for it's all God and so what are the three things we're here to learn to grow to evolve spiritually we're here to serve and be of service and we're here uh, to establish our oneness with God which the word unity even stands for and is now I know that your mission as a ministry is the transformation that transforms the world to transform lives that transform the world it's a powerful powerful mission that's what you're about you're a positive practical progressive message that is infiltrating people's consciousness to be what they were created to be to let the seed of god bloom i I bless your church and ministry as it uh, opens its arms to receive its new minister, Claudia, and uh, may she be blessed uh, to continue to lead the way and allow um, Unity Renaissance to be uh, making the difference it's intended to make in this world. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share. And uh, I just invite you all now to uh, just turn within for a moment with you, with me, if you would, uh, to turn within in the way that you're most comfortable it helps to close our eyes take a deep breath and uh, just become still with the intention that we are entering communion with God which is really a process of simply coming to union there's that wonderful verse be still and know that I am God so the spirit within us is telling us, be still, and now know that I am God, that I am peace and love and light, that I am joy. We realize that when God made you, he made you part of him. And we can say to ourselves, my journey, my journey is one of coming home to God, coming home in God. Being aware over and over again that where I am always is in his presence. That what I am forever, forever is an eternal 
luminous light being. And the guidance of God and the voice of spirit and the voice of truth that lives within me is forever bringing me back to oneness and to love and to peace, my true nature, my true identity. And so I remember to go to that deepest place in me, the cathedral of the heart, to listen, to feel, to feel my sacred connection, that God is in me, and I am one with God. There is no distance, there is no separation, only an ongoing sacred oneness. And I take this feeling of divine connection, take this deep knowing, and I take it with me into my daily life now. And I am so grateful, so grateful that I have clarity of mission in this precious life I have been given. We say thank you, God, and so it is. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have been greatly, greatly blessed by your presence. You are a giant among new thought leaders. Thank you for gracing us with your presence today. And I want to thank the team for working out the technology. We got it. Howard, we're going to see you again. God bless you. Share a little bit of uh, unity and.